Since we'll be doing enrichment planting and reforestation on our land, we took time to go out to Mount Cuba Center, which is a public garden in Delaware that focuses on regional native plant research and open space preservation. One of the long-term programs that they are working on is a 100-year-long reforestation initiative in partnership with Westchester University and University of Delaware. Though they only started the reforestation program in 2015, there seems to already be some clear outcomes on reforestation best practices based on what a land manager would like to achieve. As part of their experiment, they are implementing six reforestation methods across six different plots, which will be planted as four different replicates planted from 2015 to 2024. When all is said and done, they will have 12,000 native trees and shrubs comprising of 28 different species across 12 acres. We met up with Nate Champagne, Mount Cuba Center's natural lands manager, to check out some of the early results so we can best be informed when we start planting trees at flock. Definitely areas that are deer protected. We see um, regeneration and plants doing well in areas yeah. that aren't. The deer definitely have an impact. We do deer studies every year. We monitor deer populations, and we have about 50 to 60 deer per square mile. Oh my God, that's about where we're at yeah. right now, yeah. Which is probably 30 deer per square mile higher than it should be. Yeah. In the New York related studies, they're like usually 5 to 15 per square mile, but now we have, you know, closer to 50. Uh -huh. So, yeah. This is exquisite. I mean, look <laughs> at this. So, this is the Copeland House. They built this house in 1936. Yeah. And this was all cornfield all around wow. here. So they built the house and started it in 36, finished in 37, and they raised their family here. And she passed away in 2001, and it became Mount Cuba Center. Unbelievable. So all everything you see here is either planted and designed, or it's come up naturally. So these are all the gardens around Mount Cuba, mm -hmm. the building. There's about 50 acres of gardens and grounds. And then we manage a thousand acres of natural lands, all of the fields in the woods that we're gonna go through today. Okay. So the gardens are gardened and they're a little more highly manicured. We focus on native plants and then the outlying areas, we focus specifically on like ecological functions yeah. and carbon, like carbon sequestra sequestration and invasive plants, deer management, yeah. restoration. So even though these are planted and maintained, even though you're doing kind of more native ecological restoration, I'm assuming that you are hands-on in that too, because you're like saying invasive species. You kind of probably have to. Oh yeah, go in there's there a lot. Pick and metal. Yeah, it's natural, but yeah. um, there's a lot of human intervention to keep it that way, right. or else it would get out of control. But yeah. And do you? Get, I know you're a research center, but like, do you serve the equivalent to like a in a, a cooperative extension, or how do how do you work? Yeah, we do a lot of education and outreach. Yeah. The, we, there is a specific cooperative extension in the state, um, but we do a lot of education and outreach. We f that's a major part of our mission, is not just doing conservation here, but mm -hmm. like telling about it. Mm -hmm. So um, guests come here and learn about what we do, and we serve as that purpose, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think we should get going. Yeah, well, here we go. Here's our ride. Wow. <laughs> John Deere. Yep. Sandra, do you want to sit in the front or the back? I'll probably hang off. So. OK. <laughs> Yeah, just tell him if he's uh, being too much of a monkey. So this is our reforestation experiment. Uh, one of the treatments. Yeah. And this is an example of what our deer fence looks like. And this is, deer do not get into this. Yeah. <laughs> and when you say treatments, one of your treatments, what does that mean? Planned this long-term reforestation experiment. Mm -hmm. And the whole goal is to reforest the, this area and re reforest some of these old agricultural fields and rebuild the core forest. But at the same time, measure and monitor maybe the best approach to reforestation. When I, first start, when I first started here about 10, 11 years ago and started reforesting <clears throat> kind of in the traditional approach that they used around here, I just had a lot of questions and it didn't settle well with me that I just thought there might have been a better way. What are some of the traditional approaches that made you, like what that you were questioning? Well, the traditional approach is to plant like on a 10 foot spacing with overstory trees. And so it's very just low diversity and kind of spaced out. Mm -hmm. And we know in, 
natural settings where in natural succession when plants are growing, they, they seed in very heavily and they're, they're, they grow very densely. So we're, what we're trying to do here is plant a little bit more mimicking natural succession and natural mm -hmm. processes. And are you working then just not with trees, but are you working with shrubs or herbaceous plants or how? how yeah, so at that? the same time we came in and we're incorporating shrub species into the mix. So again, the traditional approach is plant just the overstory trees and like the five or 10 most common ones, oaks, hickories, tulip poplars, cherries, maples. So we increased those densities too and diversity. We included basswoods and all sorts of um, persimmon and Nyssa sylvatica, the black gum. Yeah. So we're, we're incorporating all those in the mix and coming in with our understory. So we have viburnum species in the, in the mix, dogwoods, red buds, um, carpinus, which is muscle wood. Yeah. When I think though of like, uh, you know, even I grew up in Pennsylvania and I think of like, you know, the places that they've cleared out, but then I always see like birches and, you know, yeah. or, or aspens, depending on where it is. Do you have any, what are the early successional yeah, varieties we don't, that? Our early successional pioneer species here yeah. are cherries and tulip poplars, black locust a lot. Yeah. So that's what we use. We, we watch what nature wants to do and we kind of are trying to mimic that when we do our tree plantings. Right on. So when I talk about treatments, we, we're having four of these planting replicates mm -hmm. um, because in science and research you need replication uh, to make it scientifically valid. So this is what our first uh, replicate that we planted in 2015. And then we're, we're intending on planting a replicate every three years uh, for 12 years until we have four replicates on the ground. So in 2015, we planted this one. So this is your earliest this one. This is our earliest one, and we can walk through there. Yeah. And then in 2018, down the road, in another yeah. area that we wanted to reforest and build core forest, uh, we planted in 2018 another replicate, and then in 2021 we planted this third replicate, and then in 2024 we're going to plant a fourth replicate. Okay. So then we'll have four of these treatments going all at once that we'll monitor for 100 years. Yeah. So we can walk in there. Great. Is the deer fence upside down? It is. <laughs> Shoot, we made that. <laughs> <laughs> the contract no. is like done. <laughs> no, we actually built it and we did that on purpose actually. Because we we are trying just to keep deer out. And there's a lot of small mammals like fox and rabbits and Oh, so you wanted to get the bigger holes down below. Yeah, we purposely put the bigger holes yeah. at the bottom so the small mammals like box turtles and wow. foxes could go through the fence. Okay. The way it's originally designed, it's excluding those individuals. So um you know, thinking about ecosystem function and yeah. supporting the whole ecosystem, we just we just want to exclude deer. Yeah. So we hung the fence upside down. Oh man, we did it wrong. <laughs> oh, we did it wrong. Oh no. <laughs> so this is you can leave it open. Are you sure? Yeah, okay. no deer are gonna get in while we're standing here, probably. Okay. But but this is just stuff we think about, and um, and that's why you're here today, I guess, yeah. to to see what other people are doing. I we do the same thing. I go to visit other places, and that's how we learn. We yeah. we see what other people are doing, and and we glean a little bit from them. Um, but that's our purpose for that. Yeah. that. We'll know that for next time as we extend the fence. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have, we don't have a lot of herbaceous material in there. I just talked about trees and shrubs. If you were trying yeah. to get like forbs and wildflowers planted in here, you might want to exclude the rabbits, but right. rabbits aren't going to do much damage in here. So we can walk along here. And like I said, there's, with each um, replicate, there's six different treatments of reforestation. So this is your traditional approach. This is like our control and your traditional approach to reforestation. So we have these larger caliper or like larger overstory trees planted mm -hmm. on a 10 foot spacing. And because we don't get canopy closure and shade right away, mm -hmm. we have to mow this grass and understory for years and years and years. I see. So ecologically, I don't think it does as well. I mean, and you're mowing the grass. Is the reason for that to... It's to suppress weeds, and actually the main purpose is to not provide metal vole habitat. So I don't know if you've had yeah. issues with metal voles. They'll start to girdle the trees down exactly. below. Exactly. Yeah. So when the grass gets high, that provides a perfect habitat for that little metal vole. Yeah. And a metal vole is like a little rodent mouse looking thing. I always think it's like between a mouse and a mole. Yeah. <laughs> it's like somewhere in between there. So when our trees are small and if we left this grass high, they would girdle 50, 75% of these trees. And we've seen almost 75% mortality. Wow. And that's a lot of money lost. That's crazy. And then your forest is gone. Yeah. So you do have to mow in these old agricultural settings for, for a, a handful of years anyway. Five, we go five to six years until the tree's a large enough caliper, probably around three inches. 
in diameter? I, I know this might be an outside question, but I think some people who practice permaculture would want to ask this stuff because oftentimes they're like, hey, let's plant in a guild and they'll plant like garlic mm -hmm. on the outside or something. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Obviously they're doing it for food production, but um, also for the standpoint of like, hey, voles don't like that smelly garlic or whatever. Yeah. But would you consider something like that? Or, ha or is that one of the test, you know, uh, tests that, that you're doing? It's not something we're doing, yeah. but that's not a bad idea either. Yeah. I mean, so you could do a million different things, and we talked about this on the ride over, mm -hmm. that there's really not one right way to do things. Um, and that's, that's what I love about my job, is we can constantly experiment and try new things. And what works on one person's property isn't necessarily gonna work on another. So like, that's a great idea. I mean, our goal here was just to plant these trees and reforest, but if, if you wanna do that and wanna try to utilize some other plants to deter I mean, that's a great idea too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but this is, this is what we're doing here. Uh, so 10 foot spacing, mowing. So in each of these plots, we are taking all sorts of measurements. We're partnering with a couple different universities, the University of Delaware right here um, in Newark, and then the Westchester University up in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, and they each year bring, um, there's professors that bring their graduate students and undergraduate students down to help us take some of these measurements and they're measuring tree growth, um, light penetration to the forest floor, uh, photosynthetic rates, carbon sequestration, um, all that stuff in all the trees, uh, in all the plots. And then over time, we're gonna be able to put a better picture together of maybe a and inform a better way to reforest. So that's our whole goal here is we're trying to inform future land managers and future restorationists of maybe a better way to do it. So out of the six test pl uh, plots of, of 2015, I know it's still a little early because it's only been about seven years. What are you initially seeing? Well, let's go take a look. Okay. <laughs> so as you can see here, uh, we have trees on the ground with yeah. barely anything underneath and we still have a lot of grass. So ecologic, yes, it's turning to a forest, but ecologically, um, it's not that great. Mm -hmm. There's trees and there's grass. Mm -hmm. So let's go down here. And how do you manage this for when you have, like we had a, I know it's called spongy moth now, uh, gypsy moth. Uh, did you have any outbreaks like we, we did upstate? No, like, we didn't have think? gypsy moth okay. down here, yeah. Lucky. Yeah. <laughs> But if you did have something that was like outbreak, how would you manage it? I guess it depends on what the outbreak might be. Yeah, it depends on the outbreak. Uh, we would probably contact the professionals and work with the state to help yeah. come in and form some recommendations. Um, okay. yeah. So this looks a little higher. Yeah, density. so let's, if we can walk in here a little bit. Yeah. Kind of want to get to an area like, like this. Yeah. Um, so this is our treatment of not just overstory, we still have overstory uh, tree species, but we also brought in the understory in the shrub layer. Yeah. So you can see structurally, this is much different. Yeah. So it's a lot thicker, um, denser, the diversity is two to three times as high, the mm -hmm. plant diversity. Um, and we plant, not only did we bring in that uh, second structural layer, the shrub layer, we planted on a five foot spacing. So we said, hey, what happens when you not only increase diversity and bring in that second secondary layer, but what happens when you plant really dense, kind yeah. of like nature does, and this is what happens. So this forest is already developing, the grass is going away, the leaves are building up, and it's building like a forest floor already. Yeah. So this is heading on that trajectory to a nice, healthy forest a lot sooner than that one over there. That one over there, we're still managing, we're still having to mow the grass. This one in here, we've been able to walk away from in three years. Right, interesting. So as from a management perspective, that's awesome. Right. If you can just get it to year three, you can walk away. And with people with little resources or little time, that's great. Yeah, and then I'm, I'm, oh, I'm wondering now, like how do, like wh what are some of the measurements that you're measuring? Is it like biodiversity, you said caliper of like the tree, like what are the signs yeah. of that, hey, this is healthier than that? Maybe we could visually see that, but yeah. what is that? Yeah, so a couple of those things that you just mentioned. So we are, um, we're measuring tree growth. Like, so we're actually physically measuring the caliper of the tree and the, the, 
the height that it's growing. Mm -hmm. And one thing you might notice is that these trees, maybe from a, from a distance, you can see that these trees are growing faster than those trees over there. Yeah. And it's because, I feel like it's because they are sensing the competition from their neighbor and they're shooting for the sky. So not only is this more biologically diverse, it's structurally diverse and it's growing quicker. So mm -hmm. there's so many factors, but we're measuring um, things like the soil biology in the soil. There's, Are you looking at the microbiota of the soil? Yeah, there's yeah. a professor that's been looking at that and how the forest or the, how the forest floor is changing over time and the biota is changing. So is this more like fungally dominated? Do you see compared to like maybe that area over there? Yeah, because it, yeah. because of the, all this organic has been able to break down, and so the forest floor is getting healthier here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're measuring insect loads in here. Um, we have a professor uh, from University of Delaware doing transects and measuring insect mm -hmm. biodiversity in here, associated with the plant biodiversity compared to out there. And we're measuring photosynthetic rates of this plot compared to that and biomass, all of that stuff. So all of that we're using as indicators of health. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I think is like different that you're doing here compared to what we're working on is that you're populating a completely barren field. Mm -hmm. How would you approach this if you have some tree coverage already? And how much tree coverage or lack of tree coverage do you need in order to be able to establish some seedlings to make sure some of those seedlings could grow up? Because in, in one way, this is like they have full sun when you first started planting them, uh -huh. right? Yeah, so that's tough. Trying to underplant into an existing forest is challenging, Yeah. Uh, especially if you have deer populations. So mm -hmm. the first thing I think what you said you were doing is, you know, you want to- Excluding wanna them. Exclude deer yeah. or at least protect from them somehow. And then just, tr I think I would just focus on those canopy gaps. Mm -hmm. So where there's already trees existing and trees wanting to grow, I would kind of just manage invasives and, and let that happen. And then I would focus on those other areas where there is some canopy light. Yeah. I, I think I have found it very challenging to try to plant in a shady forest. Yeah, um, that's why yeah. I think like we have, uh, we only have 20% canopy in one area. Mm -hmm. So there's 80% open. The other area, we're actually removing out some of the Norway spruce. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then, so it'll be like 100% open. And then we'll have another area that we're, we'll probably manage to about 40 to 50% savanna-esque, I yeah. guess, yeah. Yeah. So there are some light gaps, and I think that's where we're probably gonna be concentrating. That's where I would focus. Again, I think it's gonna be really challenging to like get something established in a really shady spot yeah. in the understory. Yeah. I kind of, I look at that as a long-term thing and I let nature take care of that spot. Um, so maybe in a hundred years, there will be natural recruitment under that shady spot. And I focus my restoration in these more like sunny, yeah. younger areas. Very good to know. Can you share like just some of the trees that we might be looking at? Yeah, so there is a, this is a, a black cherry mm -hmm. um, tree. There is a viburnum. Um, well, so this is a black cherry. Yeah. We, let me see what we have. Uh, this is a carpinus muscle wood. And this will always be like kind of an understory, kind of, mid-story tree, right? Yeah, it gets yeah. about maybe 20, 30 feet high. Yeah. And this is one of those understory species. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of sumac around here. We have winged sumac and staghorn sumac that we've incorporated in. That's, yeah. what, that's what this is. And they sucker, so that really fills in the space. Yeah. Uh, Eastern red cedars, you can see here. We yeah, have so some oaks on the edges because yeah, we have all oaks leaves. and cherries. Yeah. I mean, there, there's there's about 25 different species in this mix. I mean, I could actually even see here, like, you know. And yeah, so that's a, that looks like a chestnut, chestnut oak. oak. Yep. Yeah. And then this is a white oak, right? Yep. Yeah. So we have white oak. oak. We have about four different. We have chestnut oaks, red oaks, black oaks, white oaks. This looks like a, some type of red oak. Mm -hmm. Red oak. Red so oak. we have four different species of oaks, and I. The, the importance of oaks. I think you might know the importance of oaks. oaks. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's like that's like a dual purpose because my last name is Oaks. Too, so it's, like, it's like a running joke no, on the channel. <laughs> yeah, no pun intended, but uh, oaks are very important yeah. <laughs> uh, to the ecosystem, especially white oaks. Yeah. Um, they support so much, so many levels of the ecosystem, not only through nut production, but their leaves. We have a very symbolic white oak that was left on our land. It's probably about 200, 250 years old because it was the tree probably that demarcated one land boundary from another mm -hmm. and it was left. It also was probably damaged so it was never harvested as well and we feel like that. We actually ended up 
that was part of the reason why we actually started to enclose the forest because we saw we had no recruitment or regeneration from the oaks there. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh my God, look at this mother oak, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah. So. And oaks in general are on the decline. It's one of the preferred deer browse for deer. Um, so it's one of those trees that I think we need to promote in the forest. Is, is there um, that uh, sudden oak death? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, there's sudden oak death. Uh, bacterial leaf scorch is another one that hits the oaks real hard and, and our oaks are going away so I think as land managers and ecologists we need to focus on uh, like maintaining and preserving and yeah. restoring these oak systems yeah. and we've started to do that just this year we did a prescribed burn in our oak woodland to try to promote uh, oak regeneration and and knock back some of those mesophytic species yeah. that have come in with lack of fire, yeah. like beeches and maples, um, which that shade out this, the forest floor. We're trying to knock those back a little bit, open up the canopy and get, get oak regeneration. Okay, that's fascinating that you're using fire. Is that something that was typically seen in this region? Yeah. So I've been asked about that. Yeah, a lot of people say, you know, they associate fire with the West mm -hmm. and all that fire didn't really occur naturally here, but it, it did. There was, there was lightning strikes and it occurred naturally, but not only did it occur naturally through lightning strikes, the Native Americans occupied this land for a long, long time mm -hmm. and they utilized burning. Mm -hmm. um, every year and all the time to open up landscapes and manage systems. Yeah. So fire was a part of this community. Mm -hmm. Maybe not as much as out west, yeah. but it definitely was part of the community. Yeah. Fascinating. Should we keep, <laughs> continue to keep on walking? Yeah. Yeah. It looks like you have some gar is this garlic, garlic mustard? mustard. Yeah. So that's another one of those kind of... Uh, some of the garlic mustard. Early right disturbed... It pops up in these early disturbed sites. Yeah. We're hoping as the forest canopy closes and it becomes shadier in there, some of these invasives go away. Yeah, maybe so, well. Yeah, you kind of need to know the way plants grow and what conditions plants like. You don't need to manage everything all the time. You can some just set the stage and let, let the planting take care of itself too. I also think as the leaves fall and suppress more and more weeds, as you get thicker and thicker leaf coverage, right? So. Yeah. Exactly, it promotes like a pair. Plastic. Don't yeah, we can plastic. grab it. <laughs> <laughs> Things blow in from our neighbors. Yeah. Lemons. <laughs> so this is a, a plant, this is another treatment of, let me, I'll stand over here, of trees and shrubs, but it's planted on a 10 foot spacing instead of a five foot spacing. So okay. it's the same exact, Species composition is over there, but we planted on a 10 foot spacing instead of five. And then you have shrubs in this one. Still shrubs in yeah. here. So for a land manager, this could mean, or we could pitch this as, okay, if, if you don't have the financial resources or the people power to install uh, 900 trees on a five foot spacing, yeah. at least incorporate the diversity and bring in that shrub layer and just do it on a five foot spacing. So this is kind of a happy medium between the really dense with trees and shrubs. This is sparse with trees and shrubs. So yeah. you still have the- And you're bringing a real good point of like the practicality of it. Cause you just, you just said it. You're like, yeah. oh, we should all do that. But then if you don't have the- Resources. Resources, the funds, the people helping you plant them, whatever it might be. Um, then this is a nice, yeah. Yeah, because so. so we don't see one of these as like a winner. Yeah. We're kind of, we're installing six different treatments to better inform and people to, to make better decisions. And one isn't necessarily better than the other, although I think that one is really better. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the point of this is if you, if you have a lot of resources and you have money and want to go really to the, to the top level, mm -hmm. trees and shrubs dense yeah. is probably the best way. But there, are, there is some middle ground where you can just, you can incorporate, the, I think the diversity is important because yeah. we know the insects and wildlife depend on diversity. So, you know, this is a middle step. There's three times the number of trees in that dense plot that there is here. So, so that's three times the cost at $15 a tree. Um, that's a lot of money. I have another question in my mind, because, um, you know, I'm assuming one of these plots, you're gonna just like let nature take its mm -hmm. course to a certain degree. Do you wanna go down there? Yeah, let's okay. go down. And then we'll chat on the way. And my question is like, especially in some of those, what? Oh yeah. Yeah, so we had some breaks and we had, so these are some of our fence repairs. Is that by caused by deer? Uh, mainly the trees falling oh, down the from tree. the hedgerow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So we've had to fix it. So some of our fence. Well, is MacGyvered. <laughs> oh, look at the sumac. Yeah. <laughs> so sumac's great. And here's a, here's a viburnum dentatum, mm -hmm. uh, arrowwood viburnum. 
Sumex are great. Sumex get a bad rap. They're yeah. weedy and they sucker, but yeah. that's what we like about them. As yeah. restorationists, we want to fill that space. We want something to compete with non-native vegetation. Right. So this, Sumacs are great. Ecologically, they're great too. Um, so I was gonna ask, like, when the, when the, when you have an open gap within a forest, uh, is there a benefit to enrichment planting or just kind of letting? I know there's no right or wrong answer, yeah. but like, if you're losing species diversity, is it better to? say, hey, let me throw some extra bi uh, you know, I think biological so. matter in there. <laughs> I think so, especially in, a, in like a managed ecosystem or a managed forest. If you get storm damage and, or a tornado comes through or a hurricane or yeah. just a, a big tree falls down, it's not a bad idea to go in and actively restore that gap with something that you want in there. Right. Because if not, nature, and uh, unfortunately, with all the invasive plants nowadays, um, if nat nature is allowed to just happen, it's probably going to be an, the invasives are going to invasive plants are going to fill that gap. Right. And uh, so it's probably a good idea to go in and actively plant what you want in that canopy and, gap. And why is it that these like more exotic or invasive plants are coming in and they're better suited for that? They're just able to outcompete. So um, there's not the natural predators and natural checks and balances in our country that they had in their country. So where, where they evolved in say Asia or Europe or um, anywhere, uh, there's, that's the system that they evolved in. So they've evolved with natural checks and balances. When they escape that system and get settled in here, they don't have those natural checks and balances anymore. So back, back there where, where they came from, there was insects that fed on them and mammals maybe that browsed on them. And we just don't have those same insects to, in pests maybe to control them here. What are some of the invasive species that you see here in your plots? We deal with a lot of, in this agricultural situation, we have a lot of multiflora rose. Um, more of the woody stuff is multiflora rose, bush honeysuckle, uh, autumn olive is a big one. Interesting, okay. I know you probably deal with buckthorn up in New York. We have buckthorn, but not so much on our property. Okay. Yeah. Um, but multiflora rose, Japanese honeysuckle is a big one. Around the area, but not on our land, luckily, is Japanese knotweed. Yeah, we have knotweed. It tends to grow more in our wet areas yeah, or along, the, areas. along the creeks. Yeah. Uh, and wineberry, here's a little wineberry stem. That's a, that's a non-native invasive plant. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh. So that's just one stem, but it can grow yeah. in a thicket, just like yeah. multiflora rose. So that's what we deal with here. Uh, Herbaceous-wise, Canada thistle is a, is a big one. Uh, that's an invasive kind of herbaceous plant that grows in mm -hmm. these agricultural sections. And how are you dealing with them? Like, what's your main line we of We use a combination of approaches. Okay. So I use every tool available in my toolbox. And my first go-to is mechanical removal. Yeah. Uh, so we'll go in and either pull it or cut it down first. And then we do usually follow up with an herbicide uh, treatment. So do you drill and just do a little dab of, like... It depends on yeah. the plant. So on, like, multi-stemmed, multi-flora rose, or wineberry, we'll cut them down and allow them to reflush up a little bit, and then we'll do a foliar application with chemical. Mm. Um, on something like knotweed, mm -hmm. where that's maybe more just individual um, larger stems, or if we cut like a bush honeysuckle down or a larger thing, we'll we'll cut it down and then do do like a direct application to that stem, mm -hmm. like you were just talking about. Yeah. So there's multiple approaches, and we use multiple approaches. It's mm -hmm. not usually like one thing takes care of everything. It's usually, yeah. it's either mowing, following up with herbicide, and then following up with herbicide again, or burning, following up with herbicide, or burning and then mowing, so. Yeah, if we could pull it up by the roots, that's what we usually yeah. do, but if it's a beast, and it's been growing for a while, there's no way yeah. that our QTV depends. could pull it out. Yeah, and it depends on your setting. We manage thousands of acres, yeah. so we just do not have the people power to yeah. be hand pulling every single weed, so we do utilize herbicides. Uh, in our toolbox because we're able to be much more efficient and effective mm -hmm. over large scale. If you just have an acre or two, I'd say you could probably do it more with mechanical removal. So is this a place where you'd pull the wineberry out or you just kind of let it go? I would probably pull that wineberry okay. out. Yeah. So this is a five foot spacing with just trees. Hmm. So the trees and shrubs that we could kind of barely walk through down there. Yeah. Uh, this is a similar planting, but with just trees. So it's still dense. It's still forming a canopy clover cover it's just not as biologically diverse but similar function i mean it's it's shading out the 
the forest floor and it's developing a forest floor. Yeah, you have some. Look at the leaf litter. You have some leaf litter, which mm -hmm. is great. So again, just a different approach. One's not better or worse, but what we're doing is hopefully informing people of, hey, these are six different uh, approaches we tried yeah. and these are the six different results. Now you pick your best yeah. option. And where is the control group? Just down here? Yeah. Some wind damage? <laughs> yeah, we're also to the point where this we're just letting these forests go. Yeah. So uh, if trees and debris start to build up in here, we leave it. It's part of the forest. Mm -hmm. So this is our natural succession plot. Whoa. And so um, when this was established in 2015, we stopped mowing this. Yeah. So this was hay field. Uh, most of, all of this was hay field. It was, it was mowed annually for hay production. So this is what happens if you just walk away after seven years, this is what we're seeing, which isn't much. There's no. three trees out there, I think. And what are they? <laughs> uh, I think there might be a black cherry and there's two um, box elders. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So even with all this canopy around. And, and you this, didn't plant box elder. No. Yeah. So it's from the adjacent forest yeah. here. But with all this seed rain, we're still not seeing Nothing. natural recruitment. And is it partially because it's grassy? Like there is it harder to establish yeah. natural recruitment here? There's nobody going in and bearing seeds here? As... Yeah, it's mean, It's because of the, the dense grass layer yeah. and the thatch that these aggressive, cool season, non-native grasses Form. These, this is mainly orchard grass and fescue for, that were planted for hay production. And just, it's really hard for seeds to germinate and for trees to, to succeed in this situation. And this was 2015. 2015, we wow. walked away. So we do invasive, we do weed control, invasive plant management, yeah. and we've excluded deer. So it's not even, the deer aren't suppressing. No. It's the grass and that thatch layer that's suppressing. Unbelievable. This is so tell. This to me is like the most telling. <laughs> Everything, honestly. Well, a lot of people like why? You know, they ask me why. Me, why are you investing all this time and energy in that? Why don't right. you just let nature happen and, and um, this na like natural succession happen in this, in our area in this yeah. situation? This is what happens. So if we want to get a forest established in these agricultural fields, we need to plant them. This actually reminds me of a very similar test plot that Cornell did and they were looking at bringing in native grasses. And what they did is they cut out, out of something like this, they cut out a meter by meter square. And when you actually do that and have the bare soil, that's when the interesting stuff starts to come in. Yeah. So you might have like two or three species out here that were non-native, but then as soon as you did that one meter by one meter soil, they ended up getting nine to 11, I think, species into that uh, mix. Yeah. Most of those were native, some of them were not. Yeah. You know, you might have gotten some yarrow in there or something along those lines, but that just giving a little bare earth yeah. allowed for something else to Yeah, move so in. they removed that competition. They removed it, mm -hmm. yeah. They removed it in the one meter by one meter square. Yeah, so there, there's different. There's different people doing different things. I've heard of uh, you mulching, yeah. mulching with wood mulch or with leaves to reduce that grass competition. And they, people are seeing some natural succession in those mulched areas. Yeah. Um, but it's really like knocking back that competition is what's really needed. Oh, that's fascinating. Around here though, we, you have to, I really caution about disturbing the soil like mm -hmm. that, like removing that thatch layer and exposing that soil because soil disturbance around here means invasive plants for me. Mm -hmm. So it's just, there's no clear answer and it's yeah. not cut or dry. And this is, again, I, I said, this is like the, my, the favorite part of my job is just learning all the time and figuring things out. And, and observing no... it for yourself mm -hmm. because what you, like you just said, like what you apply here could be completely different to what we apply even in upstate New York, which is not that far away. It's yeah. not that far away, but yeah. I'm from upstate New York yeah. and you have uh, a lot less invasive plant pressure there. We are in this mid-Atlantic region of the country and I would argue that we have the highest like invasive plant pressure of anywhere. It's just um, human populations and disturbance have been part of this landscape for a long, long time, a few hundred years. Um, and. The, the sites are very disturbed and fragmented and yeah so we're seeing a lot of invasive plants here yeah amazing yeah, yeah this is great <laughs> thanks if you are enjoying the videos we produce here at flock we would appreciate if you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel
We're committing 10% of our Google AdSense revenue back into the Finger Lakes area, which is matched by our partners over at Espoma Organic. It's just a small way where we can all contribute and see a community thrive and grow. We'll see you in the next video.